Giants TV is sponsored by Racing Results Inc., where domestic and foreign cars are treated as luxurious as they look. You can come to Racing Results Inc. and also get rentals. Welcome to another episode on Giants TV. Please like, share, subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell. Share this video with your friends, families, and all loved ones. Because each and every last one of you can learn something from this. And be mindful, this can be you. Salute, salute, salute. This is Jaius from Jaius TV. You know, um, today we're going to get into talking about the wrongfully convicted, the exonerated individuals who did 10, 15, 20, 30 years in prison for things they didn't do. This continues to happen at a rapid pace. You know, um, some people don't care. You know why? Because it's not them. It didn't happen to them. It didn't happen to somebody in their family. It didn't happen to somebody they love. But at the end of the day, it could be you tomorrow. Because there's many cops and stuff like that that's still setting people up. You know, people do 10, 15, 20, 30 years. You may be you may get out after they find out that it was not that it wasn't you that committed the crime. But mentally, incarceration takes its toll on you. You never hear about that part. On how mentally Incarceration definitely takes its toll on, on individuals. You know why? Because that's an inhumane environment. No one is born to be put into a cage. Individuals getting set up, planted evidence, fake witnesses, putting lineups where they're being picked out of lineups or um that was set up by detectives and things of that nature. These are real situations. Don't think that it can't be you. Because once you do 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, you can't get that time back. And when I say get that time back, meaning that once that time is gone, that's a wrap. I don't care if you're getting millions, billions for the time that you had to spend in that system. You can never get back that time that you lost. Hmm. So you got to think about the individuals who ended up doing all that time. So imagine just sitting up in a cell. For something you know you ain't do. And no one could do anything about it. But the law. The same people that put you there. Let's check this thing on out. I don't hide nothing about who I was. But I never ever killed anyone. Or even thought of killing anyone. Or put myself in a position. To be even accused of killing anyone. What did you get locked up for? I got locked up for murder. In the second degree. And attempted murder in the first degree. The day when I got locked up. Like I was, um, I was having breakfast with my mother and my sister on St. Mark's. Um, it was like, like a whole gang of police had rushed into my house. And um, they were telling my mother like I was involved with a robbery or fight or something like that. And, at the time, like I tell you, I, like I was hanging with God, so like I didn't really even know if I was really involved with a fight or some shit like they was really trying to say. But um, they was telling they wanted to take me down to the um, precinct for questioning. Actually, I was 77 precinct. And actually, my basketball coach was the one that knocked on my door. I used to play for PA. I used to play for PA in basketball. So I guess he was the one that knocked on my door and got my mother to open the door. As soon as they got me out of my mother's jurisdiction, 
they start asking me questions about a murder, saying that I knew something about somebody getting killed or something like that. And they rode me around for like, a, I don't know how long, maybe close to an hour before they actually took me to the precinct. Once they got me to the precinct, they handcuffed me to a pole for like unaccounted amount of hours. They asked me numerous questions, listen, to question me, question me, question me. At some point, they had let me see my mother. Um, I told you like, my mother, my mother was in her right state of mind right then. She just wanted me to come home. So when she came into the room, she was just telling me, like, just tell them what you want them to know, like, so they could let you go home. All the time, like, when she not around me, they trying to put a note on me. Mommy, like, but she, she wasn't getting, like, no, nah, they wasn't, she wasn't thinking that at first, you know? And then um, when she started, like, trying to, like, question them about that fact, like, dismissed her, because, or whatever the case, um, I went through that day, I woke up the next day, and I, I, it was reality, like I was really locked up. Like I had gotten in trouble before, but I always sat at home. So um, I woke up the next day, I was in Sparfit. When I got in there, in the line of, with the guys in there, they, I was asking like, they was asking like, what's going on, shorty and shit? Like, you know what I'm saying? They could tell like, something was different. So I was like, yo, man, they picked me up, they asked me questions about some murder, and they was like, I was asking them what's up with them, like, where they had picked them up from. They was guys they had randomly picked up from the park and shit like that. They had paid them to actually be in a lineup. Mind you, this is grown men. So you know in a lineup you stand up and things like that. I was I was out I, I was so outsized by the people that was standing with me, they had to set us down because they was grown men and I was still a child. Like I was under hundred pounds, maybe like five, two, two at the time. I was a baby, you know what I'm saying? And the person they was looking for was a grown man. The person they was actually accused of this crime was a grown man. You understand what I'm saying? And um, at some point, Scott Seller came into the room. Who's that? Louis Scott Seller. Who's that guy? Um, Louis Scott Seller is a, is a rogue detective. He, he, he was actually the head of the homicide back then when I was actually going through this. But come to find out now that he's a detective that's been involved in a, like a lot of people cases that went wrong. And he's known for like, framing lineups that I know now. He came in at some point and he told me it was my lucky day that I got picked. Um, my life changed every, ever, ever, forever after that day. Oh. Which I don't consider justice at, at, at all. A lot of blame for this case falls on the head of disgraced retired NYPD detective Louis Scarcella. He's been accused of framing dozens of Brooklyn men in the 1990s for crimes they didn't commit. And I've said it, the onus had a lot to do with Scarcella, and unfortunately he affected your life and the life of many. <laughs> Bunn has been out of prison on parole for more than a decade, and in 2016, he successfully fought for a new trial. At this court hearing, the Brooklyn DA's office simply said, it was not able to proceed with the case and would not retry Bun for the murder. I'm an innocent man, Your Honor, and I have always been an innocent man, Your Honor. Take a look at this disgraceful former detective, Louis Scarcella. He's responsible for putting away a lot of innocent men and using them as recreation to fulfill his crime by putting them in fake lineups and setting individuals up. There's many more just like him. Like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell. I spent a total of 30 years in prison, 21 straight the, the last time. I did 27 and a half years straight. And he had came in for the double homicide, said he was innocent. Did you believe him? Yes, absolutely. Why? Because I was convicted of a crime I didn't commit. While in prison, they discovered something else in common. Both men believe they were framed by the same New York City police detective, Louis Scarcella. I believed them when he said the police officers had framed them. Because it happened to you? Yes. But proving they were wrongfully convicted would take decades, nearly every day behind bars, dedicated to studying law. When did you say, I'm going to the law library? Day one for me. I mean, <laughs> day one. Day one, I mean. I knew that one day I would be get out of prison because the evidence spoke louder than me. So how did you essentially free yourself? Um, studying. It was refusing to accept a decision from judges that were wrong. 
Um, and I just went back every time and said, Judge, you were wrong. Derek Hamilton is just a brilliant guy, and he uh, uh, is as good a lawyer as you'll find, and certainly among jailhouse lawyers, you know, uh, the best. These are our paralegals, these are our staff attorneys. Since co-founding the Innocence Project in 1992, Barry Sheck has helped exonerate 190 former inmates. He was not one of Hamilton or Shakur's lawyers. He says it was their own grasp of the law that afforded their freedom. The odds are enormous, and it takes people of remarkable resilience, intellect, and, and character to succeed, and that's who these guys are. Louis Scarcella, the New York City police detective who helped imprison both men, is now retired. But allegations, including evidence manipulation, led judges to overturn 11 of his convictions. And settlements have cost the city more than $30 million. That's right. The book is on its way. The book is on its way. freedom tonight for a man in prison for nearly 30 years for kidnapping and murder he did not commit. His name is David McCallum, 16 years old when he was charged and convicted for the murder uh, in, in Brooklyn. But this afternoon, Mr. McCallum walking out, a free man. He's now in his 40s. This all happening after the Brooklyn DA said the original confession was full of holes. Our investigative reporter, Sarah Wallace, is at the courthouse in downtown Brooklyn with this remarkable journey for this young man. Sarah. And Bill, what a journey. David McKellen walked out of court here in Brooklyn, surrounded by his family, including his elderly mother, who told us she has prayed for this moment every day for the past 29 years. McKellen was 16 years old when he went to prison in a case that was wrong from the very start. This picture says it all. 45-year-old David McCallum, his head in his hands, sobbing in a Brooklyn courtroom as supporters applauded, free at last after 29 years of wrongful imprisonment. I was just, just pure emotion, you know, and I'm very, very happy, but very, very sad at the same time, you know, because this situation um, in some ways could have been avoided. Because the current Brooklyn District Attorney now says McCallum and a co-defendant, Willie Stuckey, who died in prison 13 years ago, should never have been prosecuted for a 1985 Queens murder. The only evidence, false confessions of two teenagers. As you continue to hear and see these stories happen over and over and over again, don't for one minute or second think that it can't happen to you. Right. Because it's going to keep on going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here right now and I'm like, yo, you know, constantly thinking about the individuals and, and, and what they possibly could be thinking about mm -hmm. even after being awarded a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. You still remember those lonely nights in that cell. Right. The tears, the pain. Cry. And all the things that you that, that your family had to go through while you were incarcerated. Hurting them too. No. So you know what time it is, man. Let's let, let let's wake up here. Because the system ain't it, it, they're not gonna stop. It's a hurtful thing to see so many lives be affected. It's so, because it's not just the individuals who actually get incarcerated that have to deal with that pain. You got families, you got kids, grandmothers, mothers, fathers, aunts, a bunch of people deal with, with, with the pain. You know, we're going to continue to keep putting out that content on Jai's TV. You know, please like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so that, you know, when, when a video drop, you'll be, you know, it come right to you. Share this video, talk about the video, and know that... These are real stories. Thank my grandmother with her eyelids as we continue. Many challenges people face after incarceration, from getting health care to reconnecting with family. But for those wrongfully convicted and imprisoned and then fortunate enough to be freed, those same challenges exist. And for many, there's even less support than for those who committed crimes and are released on parole. Amna Nawaz and producer Frank Carlson report on the struggle that begins after freedom is won. It's part of our series, Searching for Justice. 
What about this, this series? Yeah. What is this from? Prison. These are all prison pictures. Over two years ago, Ricky Kidd walked out of a Missouri prison after 23 years behind bars. We're home now. He'd been wrongly convicted for two murders he always said he didn't commit. In the two short years he's been free, Kidd got married, moved into this house, started a business, and welcomed his new daughter, Harmony Justice, into the world. Say, look at me, daddy. I often say that freedom is the ability to embrace life fully. It feels like freedom, because I'm embracing it fully. No one has ever seen or saw a judge show so much heartfelt pain and empathy.